Hello everyone, it's me, Demetrius Villa from the High Speed Rail America Club, and we're here with a special guest, Bill Moyer, who is the author of Solutionary Rail. It's a people-powered campaign in order to electrify the railroad system here in the United States. How are you doing, Bill? I'm doing great. Thank you so much, Demetrius. I just want to say that the, the book was created by a team of folks, and, and I, they just Patrick Moz is a co-author, and it was an honor to work with everybody. I'm, you know, I really appreciate this opportunity. Absolutely. Thank you. So tell us, what do you do over at Solutionary Rail, and how, how did you get started in it? Well, our office uh, and the or the my, I'm the director of a group called the Backbone Campaign, right. and we're based on Vashon Island in Washington State. And our work around rail started in response to the aspirations of coal and oil to make our beautiful Pacific Northwest a, a fossil fuel corridor to Asia. And you know we. This is a very beautiful place and we all love it very much. And the idea that that was its highest purpose didn't ring true and it was actually somewhat offensive. And so <clears throat> we uh, were part of the resistance to that, uh, to coal trains and bomb trains. And, and at the same time, we've been fan of the backbone campaigns, been a fan of, of railroads and high speed rail. And, uh, and at one particular moment, we were challenged by railroad allies, um, railroad labor folks, to to take a 2008 paper that they had worked on and see if our community of experts could, quote unquote, green it. And so the next couple, three years were spent doing that work because, well, that's an important challenge if you come from the place that I do where you think that it's really the people who lead and the leaders who follow. You've got to find a way to overcome the divisiveness of the, our times and um, and create power for regular people to come together around good ideas. Right. Excellent. Yeah, especially since we're now living in a pretty divided times, you know, it's better that we unite people, especially through a common cause. You know, everybody, we want to make the country better for everybody. So, I mean, what better way to do it than with rail? All right. So how did you get uh, to becoming an advocate into into rail because you're part of the backbone campaign and then how how did the idea came up come up to start to make a book uh, with your team in order to say well this is something that we can do for everybody yeah well it was a, a somewhat gradual process this is my friend Mike Elliott from um, locomotive and uh, training uh, engineers uh, he uh, he made this initial challenge he shared the 2008 northern corridor paper and, and then I started reaching out to experts, and a guy named Steve Krismer, who's a former track geometry engineer, principal track geometry engineer for Amtrak, um, said yes, he'd be on 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 board uh, on the team. And Alan Drake, who is well known as a uh, proponent of railroad electrification around the world, he, he came on the team. And um, Bruce McFarling, who's uh, a fantastic economist and is really responsible for a lot of the ideas in the book. He came on the team, and we started reaching out to folks who'd done this work before, like the uh, the Rail Solutions folks, um, David Foster and Robinson Foster, who have vast experience and are really the people who I think had originally brought up some of the terms like the steel interstate with the steel interstate coalition and uh, the idea of a public belt. Uh, the the concept that the the electric the way to overcome the the infrastructure investment that was hindering private railroads from electrifying freight um, was to create a public not a tax exempt entity that would build out that infrastructure and own that that uh, own that infrastructure and run that infrastructure even though it was on a privately owned right of way right. So we have a lot of new subscribers and viewers now to the channel that are just getting interested. And, you know, they love the concept of a faster train, whether it be passenger train, high speed rail and also freight train also, too, as well, because that benefits the whole community. So they're still not familiar with some of the terms. So I would love to use to explain uh, what is rail electrification? What are the benefits? Yeah. All right. Well, I'll do my very best. Um, the. Um, uh, 
we, first of all, uh, when we built the highway infrastructure, a lot of the things that traveled on tracks moved to trucks and cars. And that created dependency in the business model of railroads to move heavy fossil fuel commodities, specifically coal. And that became a very um, close relationship between rail and coal because it kind of saved them at that time. Um, that, that infrastructure, the highways, wasn't more efficient because when you put things on a track rather than on the road, you already gain maybe three to five times the efficiency because of the, the less the, uh, reduced friction. So rails have always been more efficient than roads. Uh, cheap fossil fuels allowed folks to move things on, on the roads. It really shifted our culture. It really diminished some of the that which made rural America vibrant. Uh, the railroads were really a lifeline to uh, to culture and and the and a vitality for their communities. Uh, so, rail electrification was actually something that was done as one of the alternatives to steam engines, and it was uh, the Milwaukee Road was one example right. of that. And the rail electrification is when the um, the railroads are powered by uh, lines, of, uh, power lines that go above catenary lines. So when people see the buses with the the, the, the arms that reach up to grab that electricity right. and bring it to the engines, that's a, that's a catenary system. And that's what we had actually uh, all in, until 1974 on the Milwaukee Road. The, the trucks, the, 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 those we, where the what we think of as the wheels of the train, they're called the trucks, and those are actually powered by electricity already. But the trains we have now are called di are diesel electric trains, and so you're generating electricity with a diesel generator. So there's another uh, lack of efficiency in the system because when you use a an internal combustion engine to generate electricity, there's inherent loss of energy. So imagine if you were never introducing a fossil fuel generation uh, in the in the cycle, that could come that that electricity could come from windmills through those lines and then down to the trucks without ever suffering any dip or very little diminishing of efficiency. So you get the efficiency of the, the fuel source itself and how we're powering the trains. You also get the efficiency of the rails that are inherently better for transporting things. Absolutely. That's a beginning of an explanation, I guess. Right. Yeah. And this is all over the world where they have electrification all over in Europe and especially Japan. Uh, all the highway uh, high speed rail systems are all electrified. Most of the the commuter lines are also electrified. And this is also in, you know, in the Netherlands. They have electric lines everywhere, and it's 100% powered by renewable energy now, by wind. Right. That was an exciting video, I think, it started coming out in December or January. It's really in, encouraging. Um, the, the, a lot of people think, oh, but what about the power? How could it possibly do freight? And then it comes, we have to look back, one, to our own history, where we were doing, we were using electricity exactly because the grade change up the mountains needed that electricity. Right. Or it was cleaner through the tunnels. The first regenerative braking uh, locomotive was built in the United States uh, in 1915, and that locomotive was able to uh, take energy it was generated by going downhill and put it back into the system. The um, the uh, uh, Trans Siberian Railroad that was electrified in 2002. I think that uh, uh, Italy has something like 62 percent of its rail is electrified. Right. So. Um, it's it's you know it's slightly different I think if we're talking about some of the uh, high some high speed rail and you you know more about that than I do then uh, maybe not all of them are we're, we're dealing with a catenary system but that is what we are proposing because that is that's a quite um, uh, uh, efficient and um, and an affordable way to power the trains right. Yeah, and you mentioned the uh, Milwaukee Road also too. There's some history buffs that we have here on the channel that they're very familiar with some of that. Uh, and there's a whole chapter dedicated into the book about the Milwaukee Road, when it started, how it electrified the lines between, you know, between Chicago and Seattle, that whole entire route. 
And that's something that you put into the book to say that this is something that we can do again. So what can we learn from that history in order to put it into action in this current age? That's a good question. And some people would say, would like to argue that, no, the Milwaukee Road proved that electrification can't work. But that's not the case. I mean, it, folks who, you know, one of the things that I'm humbled by continually around this stuff is that I meet so many people who know so much more about rail than I do. I just, it's just kind of fun to be able to do this work and learn so much. But um, uh, the Milwaukee Road, there was a conflict between um, uh, folks in the Chicago management in Milwaukee Road who want, saw themselves as uh, selling off the, uh, their assets into this large, very fragmented industry that was increasingly con uh, uh, consolidating. And <clears throat> the rest of the country was going diesel. The folks on the West Coast we had access to uh, to hydroelectric, cheap hydroelectric power. They were advocating for completing the um, the system, completely electrifying the system. I think one of the lessons we learned, and that I think we we're expressing through the book, is that as much as people would like us to say, "Oh, do a small piece and and um, and prove the concept," I think what we're we're as we're asserting is one of the things we're asserting is that scale matters. That, that right now, railroad freight railroad won't usually even ship stuff unless it's going at least 500 miles. And I heard the other day 750 miles. So uh, we really want to get that efficiency of the scale. So uh, so we think it's real important that we do a corridor. Uh, you know, Chicago to Seattle and, and maybe a couple of aspects of that corridor. Another important corridor that we don't argue for in the book, but that we're increasingly convinced is a place to, um, to begin as well or to make part of a beginning um, proof of concept is the, the corridor, the Southern Transcon from L.A. Long Beach through Kansas City to Chicago. Because of the volume of freight on that, um, that route, but also because Increasingly, we're very curious about the potential leadership that tribes could provide on both the Northern Transcon and the Southern Transcon and what important partners they, they could potentially be in making this happen successfully. Right. And, and, oh, and I yeah. should say, uh, one of our ideas is that they'd be powered by renewable energy. So whereas, you know, we had um, during the, the electrification in the West – on the uh, in Washington State and, uh, and the West, uh, earlier on, um, now we have a really relatively cheap access to potential access to renewable energy all across the country. Um, one of the problems, though, is a lot of that the renewable energy assets are considered stranded assets because they don't they one either don't have a customer for the load at peak production, so they don't have a place for the surplus electrons to go. So they can't get financing, or they don't have adequate transmission, which is a similar problem. But at a larger scale, they can't do uh, utility scale um, uh, production because they don't have adequate transmission to population centers. So another reason for the Northern and Southern Transcon and the cooperation and leadership of the tribes is that they have um, a uh, disproportionate actually access to some of those stranded renewable energy resources, both wind and solar. And this would be a great opportunity, I think, for them to be able to get that um, to market and make that an economic engine for those communities, but also other rural communities and rural electrical cooperatives. Right. And that's where you go to say, you know, where the Northern Corridor can be, you know, the example to put, put this as a proof of concept, because the thing with rail electrification it's serving both purposes, not only, you know, powering the, the train to go back and forth, whether it be freight or passengers, but that's also transmitting, you know, you can have in the middle of Montana, have a wind farm, and then from there be able to transmit that electricity over to Seattle or, you know, even all the way down to Chicago. It's it's amazing what we can do with this and how this can go forward. So you were mentioning why the Northern Corridor is the best place to do that. Why, why is it? Well, it was certainly uh, for us because we were trying – it was important that we provide BNSF an alternate business model to their existing business model that was requiring them to move Bakken crude 
uh, tar sands and uh, powder river basin coal through the Pacific Northwest. Right. That to us is an unacceptable model for uh, risking our communities and our the environment that we love so much. So for us, that was a first priority was to offer BNSF an alternative to a business model to shipping heavy fossil fuel commodities. By, by the way, for our viewers, BNSF, that's the freight railroad owned by Warren Buffett. So everyone knows exactly. yeah, the, the Sage of Omaha owns a railroad. <laughs> he does. And Berkshire Hathaway owns BNSF and, and Warren Buffett is in charge of Berkshire Hathaway. And we don't expect Warren Buffett, as much as we think that he's a great guy, we don't expect him to do things just just out of, uh, uh, well, I'd love him to do it out of just pure moral obligation to future generations, but right. I think that he's a very business-minded guy. He has that reputation, and so we want to make sure that um, that this is a model that pencils out for the freight railroads as well yeah. because we want to invite them into a win-win partnership. So that said, um, and it, the Northern Corridor still is very important to us here, and the, it's very key part of the book and our argument in the book. Um, I do also believe that that Southern Transcon um, from uh, from Chicago to L.A. Long Beach is another prime location for railroad electrification. California has been decarbonizing their freight for some time, so they could be play a real important leadership role. So. I'm more and more thinking about a triangle of, you know, Seattle to Chicago to L.A. Long Beach and back to Seattle. Right. Why not? And that's definitely, you know, where it's looking forward to because that, that, the thing is we need to think more in the long term. You know, we have, you know, population increase here in the United States and, you know, we have enough land to to bring in a whole lot of people here in the United States. So the, the thing is, like, what are we going to do once we have, you know, that population increase? In the United States, how are we going to be able to move everybody around? And people say that, oh, yeah, we, we don't need trains because we, we don't use that. We used to have them before and everybody used to go around with them also, too, as well. So it's going to come back again. And we see with this generation, you know, the millennial generation, people of my generation, we, we don't want to be in the car. We, we hate being in traffic. We want to, you know, get from point A to point B as quickly and as efficiently as possible. And you want to have be able to do stuff while you do that. And, Absolutely. And the fact of the matter is that these railroads that we own, that are in this country, those corridors, which are hard, we can't remaking those those rights of way. That's that's monumental. That's that's too that's a bridge too far, right? But if we use existing corridors, that means we have to partner with the freight rail, and the, and we have to help them shift. And the millennials, I believe. I love being on the train and being able to get my Wi-Fi and hang out and, and do my work and then get to the place where I'm going. And um, and so th it just makes so much sense. The ra the roads, the highways, they aren't paying for themselves. All that deferred maintenance is only getting worse. It's going to get more expensive. The trucks don't pay. The tr long haul trucking doesn't pay its fair share. There's like five thousand, four or five thousand deaths a year on the highways from trucks and. Um, you know, this is this is just a thing that makes sense. It's a win because when you like when you say when those what the population centers when uh, or when as people come into this country and as we evolve as a country, um, we want to have vital rural places as well as vital urban places, and we should be able to communicate and transmit people and information and goods uh, amongst those communities. And rail is the is like a life. It's a circulatory system for a healthy society. It's more efficient, and there's just it's just no good sense in not doing that. Uh, and so it's an exciting possibility, and it's something that you know it's not an ideological thing. You know, it's um, people across this political spectrum have positive experiences and memories of rail, as well as a lot of current need for getting goods to market and uh, getting people, uh, creating economic vitality and um, unburdening themselves from some of the worst impacts of fossil fuel dependence. So I think we got, I love the work you're doing and I think that there's a real win-win when, um, when we lock arms on stuff like this that 
And I'm, so I really appreciate you taking the time with me. No, I, I thank you for doing this also too as well, for, you know, for taking the time to put this together. I really appreciate it. So, and that, that's what, you know, what we want to do is to, you know, bring people and bring their ideas together. Uh, like, as you were saying, you know, it's a win-win for everybody. It's, you know, not just a win-win for, you know, people in this current generation, but for the next generation. And that's where, you know, what we mentioned now is getting, you know, what we mean by everybody together. You know, I'm more I'm more business-minded because, like, you know, I used to be a mechanical engineering major and then I switched over yeah. to business. So I'd understand, you know, if I see something that's going to be a profit, you know, not just now, but in the long run, I will say, hey, we got we got to do this. You know, it makes money and then the money can go back into the into the economy and help out people and bring jobs, bring the economy up and bring people. So that's why we know we need to do something like this to go on. Oh, and, and, you know, I looked through this and I, you know, if I was in Warren Buffett's shoes, this definitely looks like something, you know, I'm, I'm getting into my, you know, 80s right now. I'm, I'm, you know, I want to leave something here for the next generation and yeah. you know give a whole lot of jobs especially now because in the current political environment I'm, I'm a little more optimistic than more people in this one i think we have the perfect chance to do something now with the infrastructure especially since the president keeps mentioning and mentioning it this is the perfect chance to you know to put the money into this uh through you know private public partnerships through private companies or you know to the governments whichever works for everybody and put this in there so how can we put in shareholders like Warren Buffett, BNSF, governors and communities along the lines, and even as you mentioned, indigenous tribes, how do we bring everybody together to to make this happen according to the book? Well, <clears throat> that is really the stage that we're in right now, is, um, is making it clear to fo- helping folks clarify what are their interests, what do they need to get for their, for their communities to be, to feel well served by this proposal. Uh, and for uh, for an urban community that's uh, along the tracks, that's that's it might have a lot. It's going to have a lot to do with the diesel uh, reducing diesel exhaust that's impacting the health of their kids. Uh, for the tribes, it's um, it, it might be uh, renegotiating some um, easements that were uh, taken away unjustly, and it might be uh, getting a way to um, generate power for local consumption and also for export uh, for, I think, for um, for rural agricultural communities. It's about getting access to capacity to move the crops when they need to and having the speed and regularity of service so that when they have um, perishable uh, crops, they can, um, they can get those on a train and get them to population centers. So that's just touching a, you know, a few of the sectors. But uh, for Warren Buffett and those folks, I think, and for everybody, we need to do a feasibility study. We need to take the, the preliminary vision, visioning work and historical work and, and the mapping of the coalition, a non-ideological coalition, the mapping of, that we do in the book, and, um, and get that coalition uh, behind feasibility studies at the state level and at the federal level to um, to make sure that uh, to figure out how fast on average and how regular service does that do those trains need to move at in order for uh, for what's the sweet spot for the freight that is traveling on the trucks now to move back to the tracks once we know that then we can figure out well where's the where's the we need the cost benefit analysis of well, which part of a particular corridor do you have to straighten to increase the speeds to get up that average temperature, a temperature and speed? Um, what is the um, – where, where is it going to be the easiest? Where do you have to move? Where do you have to do grade separation? And so you don't create a problems in, in urban places or rural crossroads. So there's a, lot, there's a lot of work that still needs to be done. But you know what? Compared to a lot of things, this is real cheap. You know, just to put in the catenary system is only about, you know, it's two and a half million a mile for um, for uh, double track. You know, that's that might sound like a lot to you and me. No, but- that's actually com- compared to what we've been, you know, putting on some recent videos about, you know, some of the projects that have been ridiculously expensive here in the United States. That's very cheap. <laughs> two that's and a half so million. Cheap. That's insane. I mean, I'm a big fan of, I want sound transit to work out in the Pacific Northwest. I want it to be, you know, all that stuff to work. But this, they're talking billions and billions compared to our millions and millions. Yeah. And this, the you know, the right of way already exists. So I think uh, we sent a letter to uh, Warren Buffett last week and I'm crossing my fingers that 
that he'll receive that with an open mind and a readiness to have a conversation. Right. That's absolutely. Bring that's, in that's the right awesome. heads, you know, and get them around the table, and let's figure it out. Like let's solve problems. It might seem hard. It might seem complex, but dang it. I have no patience for excuses. Oh, it's too complicated. Everything's complicated. Survival of the species is complicated. Let's solve problems. Exactly. Let's freaking do it. Exactly. That's we got to do. It. We got to think big, and we got to you know we have challenges in front of us. But that's the whole point. Those challenges are meant to get over. Yeah, yeah, and we don't, you know, and people get really excited, and I'm fine, you know, cool, Elon Musk and vacuum tubes and all that stuff, oh. sounds great, but I think, honestly, that's probably not going to happen in, t in the time it needs to happen, or it's probably, it might not happen at all if we don't start bringing railroads back to the center of our economic and social you know, it's our society. Exactly. I'm, I'm not going to get into Hyperloop because I've already mentioned about, you know, why it's not a good idea so many times on this channel. Just, just okay. you know, out of not just physical reasons, but just like, you know, in retrospect of like, you know, comparing servers between Maglev and Electric. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense in that. But I'm not going to get into it because then I'll right. be here for, for hours and hours. <laughs> right, right. And, and, you know, the real yeah. point is like, yeah, so it's something that we have something. now. We have something here that we can use and do it right now. And, you know, it will last for a long time. It will still be, you know, useful. Boom. Right? Exactly. I mean, that's that's it. It's like, okay, do, pie in the sky, no. You know, some of that stuff, like, uh, you know, it's, it seems so elitist, you know, and it's only going to serve as, like, a certain part of the society. And, 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 and people should be pissed about that kind of thing, you know. Whereas this... This, I think, is reaching into community and saying, hey, no, actually, this is going to serve everybody. <laughs> and and, and, and I, you can go with a straight face and talk to farmers and people in tribes and, and rural communities and electric co-ops and, and, um, and urban uh, centers and with a straight face say, this is a good idea and this is in all of our interests and we'd really like – to work together on this. Exactly. This, this would be a good thing for farmers because I know my family used to be a farming family back when uh, they were over in Cuba. So they, they used to, you know, the whole thing. And I would know, you know, I'd understand, like, especially for farmers to get their crops over, you know, in time and especially like right there close to them. This is the perfect thing. Yeah. Cool. <laughs> Excellent. So let's make it happen. No, so we really want uh, people, we really appreciate if people would um, get the book and there's an ebook if people prefer that yeah i was just um, about to ask so how how can people be able to get the book and support this campaign not only to support it like what can they do themselves in order to get this moving on yeah so um so get the book yourself get familiar with the, the concept and then um uh get books for your elected representatives let's get let's target the governors let's get them in their departments of transportation let's force them to do an honest feasibility study be very careful there's some folks out there who do not want to see this happen there's interests who would like to power trains on on fracked gas and i think that's a terrible idea but um but so be careful but we want honest feasibility study get the book get it to your elected officials get your local um uh, party organizations, labor organizations, fraternal organ, whatever your group that your association that you're a part of, have them and they if they do resolutions around policy ideas, have them do a let a letter of a resolution. If you go to solutionaryrail.org under take action, you'll see a, a a page on resolutions. The Washington State Labor Council, for instance, did a resolution last summer. We're working with. Uh, district uh, political organizations and getting them to, to do resolutions to, to the governor and the legislature to do feasibility study. Letters to Warren Buffett. God bless you. If you can send some letters to Warren Buffett and urge him <laughs> to, to, to pitch in and be a good partner in this, he could really set the pace. You know, um, the Northern Transcon and the Southern Transcon are both owned by BNSF, which used to be called Burlington Northern Santa Fe. Right. That's the why the B and the N and the S and the F. So um, I, read the book, share it with your friends, get your, your NARP, your National Association of Rail Passengers, right. your High Speed Rail Association. Get them interested in it. Get them to do a book club. Um, Invite your friends who are interested in renewable energy and, and, and transmission and have them and climate 
and have them take a look at it. Your railroad labor folks, make sure that they're checking it out because Railroad Workers United are one of our partners and they're, they've been really cool about this. We've learned a lot from them. Be really good to get some of the agricultural community checking it out and giving us some of their ideas. So whatever sector that you're a part of and the folks that you're working with, this is a way forward and a way to build conversations with folks in very divisive times. And we really urge you to, to utilize it as such. Absolutely. We thank you so much, Bill. We're going to put the link also too to the book right now so you can be able to check out Solutionary Whale, the website, and also be able to buy the book in both physical and electronic format. And you can be able to send the link also to other people as well. We'll also be putting it on our Facebook group. If you have not joined our Facebook group, you can join it right here. We have the link also too on the video. And Bill, if you're, if you're a part of Facebook, we'd love to have you on there also too as well. Oh, consider it done if I'm not. Absolutely. All right. Thank you so much, Demetrius. I so appreciate it. Of course. And we thank you also, too, for coming on to this show. And we're continuing our campaign also, too, as well, to hashtag build it. We got to build our railroad system back here in the United States. And we're doing it through everybody, everybody and everything we can. So, Bill, thank Let you so much for coming on. Let us know what we can do to support that effort. We totally are on board with you, too. Absolutely. All right. Well, thank you. And we'll see you soon. And we'll see you all next time. Thank you. Forward together. Hello, everyone. Demetrius Vela. We hope you enjoyed that interview. It was a fantastic interview. And it's, it's great to see, you know, people around the country coming together in order to make the revolution happen. So hashtag build it. We got to spread that around. Also, if you have not subscribed to the High Speed Rail America Club, click right here to subscribe to it. And we also have other videos also for you as well in order to see. We'll see you next time.